Hi, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to tonight's regional webinar. Uh, my name is Rosie Phillips, and I'm the Deputy CEO of Bipolar UK. Um, if you're expecting Simon tonight, um, unfortunately, he sends his apologies. Um, he would have loved to be here, but um, unfortunately, he couldn't. And I know he's very, very proud of his northern routes. Um, so I'm sure he will rebook um, and schedule um, another event soon and hopefully in person. So um, whilst we're doing it online, it's, it's great to be able to um, also look to forward to plan something in person in due course. So welcome tonight. I hope you've got a, a beverage of your choice. Um, you're putting your feet up and listening to um, information about our commission and also sort of forward thinking around uh, early intervention and diagnosis. So um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, the Bipolar Commission that we've um, been working on, and it's a really brilliant piece of work that Simon and his team have been developing, um, and including Anna, who will be joining us at the end of the session when we begin the Q&A, um, the questions, just to, just to say that a lot of work's going on behind the scenes, and I know Anna's been interviewing busily, interviewing people um, in terms of kind of getting some input into the Commission and also finding out more about what people do, kind of how they live with bipolar, but also what is helpful in terms of uh, surveys that we've put together and also the sort of format in the reports that have been coming out. So I'll tell you a little bit about those shortly. Um, so just going on, so we started in, in March, we launched, we launched this uh, bipolar commission in March on World Bipolar Day at our conference. And that was an online conference. It's the first time we've run an online conference, which um, which was very successful and we'll, we'll be following that up again next year but um, it was a great way to both engage the bipolar community but also to start this process of trying to find out more how to support and help people who are affected by bipolar. Um, so one of the aims um, is to improve the quality of care that people with bipolar um, receive but also to reduce the number of suicides and we know that one in 20 people who take their own lives in the UK have a diagnosis of bipolar and that's a really huge statistic and it's one that we are trying to challenge and work, work towards reducing. Um, it's likely to have significant underestimate as well because it does exclude people who are either undiagnosed or have a misdiagnosis and if you imagine you've got a misdiagnosis or go undiagnosed it can be a very significant impact and those are two factors which, which increase the risk of suicide hugely. Um, and we know also that over a million people in the UK have bipolar. Um, the most comprehensive prevalence of data, and that's from the Adult Psychiatric um, Morbidity Study, AMPMS, in 2014, that found 2% of the population in the UK aged 16 and above are living with bipolar. So that's quite a huge statistic too. Um, and as a charity, we aim to work at both supporting people and their friends, family and loved ones. From our survey on diagnosis, it was found that 84% said diagnosis were these are helpful or very helpful. And if you think again, that's a very, very high number of percent of our surveys that have gone out through the commission. Um, and that's showing how helpful it is to get to that point where you can start to understand your condition. You can start to learn about tools about self-management and you can also meet other people within the community that have diagnosis and often, when I meet people within our support groups, it's the first time they've said, I've actually met somebody who's got bipolar. And that might even be after several years. It's the first time they've come to a group, either online or in person, and actually said they've met somebody with bipolar. And that's, that's hugely uh, important as well to, to recognise. 80.5% um, of um, diagnosis gave an exclamation, for, an explanation, excuse me, for their past experiences. And I think living with a condition, um, it can take up, we know it can take up to 9.5 years to get diagnosis. And often people will go to the GP, uh, for example, when they're depressed, um, but they may not always go to the GP when they're feeling slightly more higher mood. Um, and often do, they are treated for depression rather than screened for anything more significant. And often that diagnosis takes a long time, but also means people may have broken relationships, they may have challenges in work, they may lose jobs. Um, there can be quite significant reasons why it impairs people's life and once you get a diagnosis or treatment you can then begin to live with it. I live with a condition just to share that um, and I think that too can mean that you can start to actually work on areas of your life that improve and then again so you actually 
can have a sort of mood stabilizer, which can actually help you manage those extremes that, that you can come across. Um, so 68% of people diagnosed and um, said a diagnosis enabled them to get better medication. And, and similar to what I just mentioned, um, I think after I received my diagnosis, I was then given some uh, medication, which was a mood stabilizer. And it was different to the first one I was given, um, which I didn't really get on with. But the second time I reviewed my medication, it enabled me to, to actually uh, just get on with my life, really. Um, and that was hugely helpful. And I think from my own perspective, I think there's a similar reflection in our survey that people have said. 47% um, of diagnoses helped them uh, to better understand, uh, despite the stigma. And I think, I think we all know that mental health still carries a level of stigma, but working towards um, kind of challenging that, coming to terms with it, and also understanding it from your own point of view, I think is hugely helpful. So a diagnosis helped 47% with that. Um, and also for many, a diagnosis makes it possible to get effective treatment and support. Um, and if well, we know from our experiences with our community, with uh, our staff who live with the condition, we know people can live well with this condition if they receive the right early treatment and access to treatment and support and things like better support groups or self-management tools, um, kind of beating bipolar course, um, I know is really popular. Um, so I think things of that nature could really help people to come to terms with the condition, but also learn to live with it effectively. Um, and it could also help friends and family support somebody with a condition. And I think that's, again, is, is an area the commission will um, seek to, to address. Um, and it helps people have fewer relapses, which, again, reduces the cost burden on, on organisations like the NHS and also um, within the industry, because it means that people maintain stability, they can work. And they can learn and earn a living. Um, so there's sort of cost benefits around, but there's also sort of emotional um, and benefits the individual. And I think we can sort of share those and understand them. Um, the full bipolar commission report um, will be released in March 2022. And we're hoping to have another um, really successful event as we did online. We had a great parliamentary uh, release of the interim report in uh, the end of October. Um, and that's online. So if you if you did want to explore that in a bit more depth, um, if you pop onto our website, um, and I'll get Anna to pop that in the chat, there's a link on the resources tab, which will have the bipolar reports under it. So those are real, really worth a read. Um, and there's a more in-depth report, and then there's a short summary as well, which you can touch, touch on. Um, so one of the, the reports and the aims in March 22, by this point, we would have made it one of our recommendations we're hoping to, to achieve by then is to make it easier and quicker for someone with bipolar to get a diagnosis. And as we mentioned, the reasons why that's so important um, to help people just get on with their life um, and enjoy it and, and the same as any other person can expect um, to have good quality treatment and, and quick treatment. Um, number two is improve access to specialist treatment for people with bipolar. Um, one of the common questions we're often asked as an organization is how do I get a diagnosis? Um, so improving that kind of information availability, not just to individuals who may think they have the condition, but also professionals who are treating people and GPs especially, to give them added support and information to be able to disclose that to people and help them move on, help them get that access to mental health services, to psychiatric care who can, who can do full assessments um, and give that official um, formal diagnosis. Develop evidence-based online screening tools for people affected by bipolar. Um, so they can seek an assessment with a healthcare, healthcare professional. Um, I think one of the sort of tools of, of we all do similarly today is when you're feeling something is maybe we go to the internet and actually look up the symptoms. Sometimes that's super helpful, sometimes it's not because actually having a proper diagnostic tool would actually help people feel um, actually they're getting to the point where it's a useful, um, an actual useful tool rather than something that could be, and it is a very vague Kind of description of symptoms. So one of the things we hope to, to actually develop is a proper screening tool um, that would enable people to actually access it uh, and a healthcare professional and that's something that we're looking at. Um, funding uh, more research into bipolar including genetics and its ethical, um, uh, ethical implications. So I think at the moment there's a lot of disparity between some of the physical hair condi um, health conditions which means people with um, funding is, goes to, to more physical symptoms uh, and there's disparity between uh, mental health in terms of funded research 
So that's one of the areas we'd look to seek to actually improve um, uh, funding and into genetics and ethical implications. Improve awareness of proven self-management techniques. And we know um, that self-management courses such as beating bipolar, some of the courses that we've run in the past um, are really effective tools. Um, and we also know we're working currently with Cardiff uh, University um, and Professor Ian, Ian Jones and his team, and we know the course, the BPEC course they run has been really effective. So we're working towards developing those um, self-management techniques, but also improving those for everybody and making them more accessible and more widely accessible. Um, and I think one of the key things that we need to remember is um, everybody should have access to equal healthcare. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So the commission aims to, to create a more level playing field in those areas. Um, the other area that we aim to achieve is change the narrative around the public perception of bipolar. And that again come back, comes back to the question where people said that the diagnosis helped them despite the stigma. So it's reducing the stigma and encourage understanding. Um, so much more education, much more understanding of the condition, and also educating people from all ages. So it's not just young people that are likely to be diagnosed sort of 16 plus, and it's not uncommon to get a diagnosis at university age. Um, but it's very important that we see how we can educate young people as well as older people who may have been living with symptoms for years. Um, and also it might have been a situation where they've never had that diagnosis or that conversation, but they just lived. And sometimes people self-medicate. There's lots of reasons that people never get a diagnosis. I spoke to somebody recently who was in their, their relative was in their 80s and they were suspecting they'd had bipolar for, for their life and, and never really got treatment for it or, or been understood. Um, so I think it's so important that we have those health um, treatments available and early diagnosis and early intervention that can help people. Um, thank you for listening. Um, if you would like more information, please do see our website. Um, there's a lots of resources and availability about our services as well as the commission, um, full report on there. I'm going to hand over now to Addy, who's going to join in and um, welcome Addy and thanks for joining us this evening. Hi, thanks Rosie. Um, hi everyone. Um, as, as Rosie said, I hope you've got uh, a nice hot beverage uh, of your choice. Um, thank you for joining today. Um, I'm uh, a child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, and I run a uh, second opinion service in Newcastle. We have uh, referrals from across the UK for under 18s where other child psychiatrists are unsure as to what the diagnosis is or wanting specialist advice on management. Um, I wanted to just share with you some more thoughts about um, why uh, not only a timely but um, accurate diagnosis is important. In child and adolescent mental health, we focus very much on um, getting, uh, uh, not just thinking about a diagnosis in a young person, but actually thinking more broadly about what the formulation is. So what are the strengths of that person? What are the challenges that a diagnosis poses and how that informs their management plan? So thinking holistically uh, about um, uh, uh, developing you know, the diagnosis. And as, as, as Rosie said, thinking about the diagnosis is not something that holds one back, but allows you to move forward and hopefully reduce stigma in the long run. There are some particular challenges uh, towards you know, assessment and diagnosis of bipolar in under 18s. Um, adolescents by itself, I think most of us here have lived through uh, the turbulence of adolescence, is a time of emotional turmoil. So a lot of us experience mood fluctuations. Um, that can add to the challenges of getting a diagnosis because We've heard from a lot of young people and their families when they come into our service that they were often told by the school or the GP uh, or in, in secondary care that um, they 
apologies for that. Uh, they were also uh, informed that, uh, oh, don't worry, you'll grow out of this. And that might be true for some young people, um, but I think it's about that severity of the mood fluctuations, which is different in bipolar disorder. Unfortunately, we haven't very good screening tools. Uh, and I think this is, it's great to hear Rosie on behalf of Bipolar UK talking about the need to develop good screening tools to help, you know, our GP colleagues who do a very difficult job. They've, they've barely got, you know, five minutes to spend with every patient. Um, so if we had good screening tools that might help the GPs and indeed child and adolescent mental health services think about um, what pathway and what assessment to be done with, um, with young people and, um, and families. Um, we, as I said before, we, we accept referrals from across the United Kingdom and I must admit it is, it's quite sad to hear that people are still waiting on average nine and a half years before a diagnosis is made. And I think that's, I can only, I can only imagine how difficult and challenging that might be for anyone at any age, but imagine being a teenager um, and, and having all of the other um, tasks and, and, and development that you have to do in terms of education, individuation, friendships, romantic and otherwise, and then to also develop a disorder, um, you know, any chronic health condition is challenging. Um, but yes, something like bipolar disorder then adds to those challenges. So I think what I wanted to really emphasize is um, the importance of, I couldn't agree more how important it is that we, that, that people affected by bipolar get a timely diagnosis and don't have to wait nine and a half years because it impacts on their development trajectory, especially in teenage years and early adulthood, um, and perhaps prevents them from meeting their full potential. Um, I know that very often um, services may not appear as responsive as you might like them to be, um, but one of the things that probably would help is if you had good, accurate mood charting done. I know Bipolar UK have the, um, have the app. Um, there are other apps available as well. So thinking about um, you know, how you can provide more evidence to services that are assessing you, that there actually is an issue that warrants assessment. Um, and I'm sure in the Q&A, uh, panel discussion, we'll hear more about scenarios such as when things were difficult, what you may have been told was the matter, or perhaps your concerns weren't as validated as they should have been. But hopefully collectively, you know, we can influence service provision and development um, in the long run. I think the Bipolar Commission will really, really be um, quite instrumental in helping change this scenario. So I think that's all I had to say at this point. Um, I know we've got um, Olivia who um, would probably want to provide her perspective on what a diagnosis is, means for her and, um, and why that's been helpful or not. So over to uh, Olivia. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for uh, introducing me. It's really lovely. Uh, I've prepared a short, uh, well, not even short, it's a word document with a little uh, speech. Um, so, as Dr. Sharma was saying, uh, you know, adolescence is quite difficult, you know, anyways, as everyone bloody knows it's quite difficult to go through, but when having bipolar disorder on top of that, it's, oh, it's not a vibe. <laughs> so I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type two after battling with depression and anxiety. I was bullied a lot too, which you know, obviously didn't help. 
I had panic attacks at school, I self-harmed, I could barely go on buses or, you know, go shopping, you know, shopping centres, so extreme anxiety. Uh, there was this one time I was in HMV, and I started panicking, like, people in the way, it was, you know, like, Christmas time, people in the way, and I just started screaming and panicking and flailing my arms about, it was really, I, I made quite a scene, and I had to escape. However, there was this one aspect of my mental health that was just, you know, the key element to my bipolar diagnosis, which was my impulsive spending. Uh, my bank is not very happy. You know, my bank account is not very happy with the impulsive spending. <laughs> um, in the summer, um, just gone, I would bought, you know, the telly, a MacBook Pro, Nintendo Switch, several games, all because of a manic episode triggered by my birthday actually you know like money is a big trigger for me like especially large amounts of money because I'd only just turned 21. Um, when I eventually came down from my high I returned several of the items. Uh, the teachers at my school were worried about how my mental health would affect my studies as I was taking GCSEs at that time so you know exams, personal relationships, all part of teenage life but with you know, anxiety and mental health and bipolar on top of that. I didn't know I had bipolar then, but it was a whole thing. Uh, so they, rec they recommended me to go to the GP. My GP was very understanding. She was really nice. But it was really weird to talk about all these feelings. I just kept locked up in my head. I've always had anxiety. Even when I was in nursery, I was worrying about big you know, like secondary school. You know, I was worried about how I'd hold a tray at lunchtime because I was so small. Um, I've never really spoken about my emotions until I was about, you know, 14 when I went to see the doctor. I used to keep it all in, which is very bad. You should, you know, never keep your emotions all in because it's like a volcano. When you've kept, kept it all in, then you drop a pencil and it's all, it's mad. Um, voicing how you feel is so important in everyday life. And I understand that now. It helped me to communicate more effectively with my boyfriend and improve relationships. Uh, when I was a teen, I was battling with my emotions day in, day out, taking out my frustrations on myself, you know, by self-harming. I'm not going to go into that because it's triggering, but um, I was then referred to mind initially after seeing the doctor. And after my 12 sessions, they were still concerned and had to tell my parents about my suicidal thoughts. Uh, didn't really act on it which is really good, otherwise I wouldn't be here, you know what I mean? Um, they had to make the referral to child mental health services. My diagnosis journey could be perceived as different to others with bipolar uh, due to early intervention. Uh, most people with bipolar, you know, they don't get diagnosed until later on in life. And I was quite early. I was, you know, I was caught early. I know people with bipolar who have been sectioned or have been put on antidepressants and have skyrocketed themselves into a manic episode. This is why early in intervention is so crucially important. It could prevent hospital admissions and silly mistakes. Even just asking, you know, that one question of do you have periods when you feel unusually happy? It can stop antidepressants being administered to patients with bipolar or a mood disorder. Uh, my initial assessment at child services, you know, they picked it up right away, may mainly through my impulse and spending behaviours, as I mentioned previously. I was luckily referred to the Specialist Adolescent Mood Disorder Service at Walking Hospital in Newcastle. The doctor I saw was actually here, Dr. Sharma. He's a very lovely man and he just knew exactly what was going on in my head. And it, you know, it just felt great to finally be, you know, felt understood. Um, after an abundance of mood diaries, oh, the mood diaries, I'm just not gonna talk about that because pain in the bum for me personally. Um, an appointment, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type 2 when I was 15. I remember that day very vividly. I felt quite numb when they told me, but also it kind of made sense. You know, something, you know, like a, the final jigsaw in the jigsaw puzzle, it just made sense. There were feelings of relief, but I was also very scared and anxious. A concoction of emotions. Uh, what on earth was going to happen to me? You know, what, what's going to happen? Am I going to be locked up in you know, a padded room? No. What actually did happen to me was lots of therapy, which helped greatly. 
and you know medication yeah it took a, a few to get right but I'm on the right medication for me and the scariest part was the blood tests since I hate needles everyone involved in my care was extremely nice uh, I once had a meeting when there was all the people in my care like and there were at least six or seven professionals there it was slightly intimidating but you've got to think you've got to rationalize it these people are there for me you know to help me you know it's it was yeah it was you know intimidating but you know they're just there to help you uh teenage me always thought bipolar disorder was a big scary illness <laughs> when i reveal to friends that i've got bipolar i have to reassure them that i'm not you know an axe murderer i was in a club one night with a friend from freshers and i was you know slightly slightly drunk and i told her i had bipolar i had to reassure you i wasn't gonna hurt her because you know the media depicts people with mental illness in a really bad light which is really not the vibe and she was really lovely and, re and she reassured me that she didn't think i was a psycho yes the diagnosis was a bit of a shock as i believed that the disorder would hinder me uh, throughout my life uh, i went home after the doctor's appointment of the diagnosis and I baked. I had lots of pancakes and then I had a bit of a cry because it was a bit of a shock to the system. I don't know why, when I'd been, they told me that I was going to be, you know, tested for bipolar, but you know, it was still a bit of a shock. But after that, I felt better. I was wrong about bipolar hindering me. Having the diagnosis and getting over the shock of it has not held me back at all. It's even opened new doors and pathways for me. A passion to help others as well as volunteering with Bipolar UK. I've been involved in mental health app development, conferences to discuss diagnosis, transition services, as well as early intervention. My aspirations are slightly cloudy at the moment as I'm in my final year of uni and dissertations. Oh, <laughs> dissertations are hard. But I just know that everything's going to be all right. Um, I've had people around me, like my boyfriend, my friend, my best friend, they've always been like, oh, you, you're going to graduate, you know, there's no way that you're not going to graduate. And like, for anyone who is struggling out there, it's going to be all right. You know what I mean? I've got so many options and opportunities available for me after I graduate. I just need to enjoy my last few months at uni and just have faith. It's been a bit of a bumpy ride with my highs and lows, as well as additional mental health diagnoses. I'm looking forward to what the future holds for me. Um, so that was my little talk. I think, is it Stuart next? Um, I think so. So welcome Stuart. Yeah, if you want to pass on to Stuart. Thank you, Olivia. Hello. Um, hello everybody. Thank you very much. It's, it's, um, it's very hard, uh, to, um, follow Liv. Uh, that was, um, incredible. Um, Thank you very much for, for, for sharing that. Um, um, I'm so like Addy, I'm a, a psychiatrist. I work in the northeast of England um, in Newcastle. I work for um, Specialist Mood Disorder Service. Addy works in the sister service, um, uh, or maybe even part of the same service, um, but he works with the young people. I work with the adults. Um, and um, I, I, I've come to the uh, Specialist Mood Disorder Service after a number of years uh, working on uh, inpatient on an inpatient unit. I um, I also conduct clinical research, and um, the research is around about better understanding mood disorders, uh, particularly bipolar disorder, and then trying to use that understanding to develop new treatment strategies and to test those treatment strategies to see if they work. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about um, some of the current research that's going on, um, particularly about a couple of studies that we're very involved with or that we lead from Newcastle, but that are running across the country. Um, and I guess I'm looking at the um, people who are attending. I guess you're from all over the country. Um, now, what I don't know is whether you've got uh, capacity through Zoom to chat and to um, and to comment as we go. Uh, and if you have and you're happy to do so, I'd encourage you to put some things in the in the chat. Um, maybe that you can't do that, in which case someone could uh, um, 
uh, I was going to say, if you can't, someone could let me know, but you can't let me know because you can't. Um, but um, uh, that would be helpful. Um, and what I want to do, I'm going to, I've got some slides. Let me see if I can put my uh, slides on. Um, I sort of apologize for having slides, but it gives me a sense of scientific um, security after seeing uh, live uh, fly like that. Um, okay. Uh, oh, I can't do that because it's disabled. Um, so that's quite a bonus actually, because we can go without them. Uh, but I can you I can look at them. So um, if they do come back on, the advantage of them coming back on is we've got a couple of um, um, websites um, that I could link you to. But you can always have a look at those later. Um, but what we've got is uh, so I'll go through the. Um, I'm looking at slides, which might make it sound a little bit odd. I've got my name for the first slide, just in case you do get hold of these. I've got my Twitter handle. Um, and I'd encourage you to, to follow me on Twitter. At the moment, all I do on Twitter, really, to be honest, is rant about the government. Um, but if um, if you do follow me, then I will try and do some more bipolar-specific things. Um, I've got the address of our website, the Northern Centre for Mood Disorders website, um, which has got uh, some nice resources. It's not just for people in the north, so if you're from across the country, uh, th that's fine. And it's also got information about our research register, so in Newcastle, we have a register, um, uh, I suppose a collection of people with whom we can share latest findings on research and, and, uh, and such like. Um, and so if you can join on that, that, that would be great. Um, so um, what I, the two studies that I want to talk about are both drug studies, both working in, in bipolar depression, by which I mean, um, people who are currently depressed um, and have previously been manic or hypermanic. Um, and um, I'd be interested in what you guys are, are taking, but NICE guidance and the British Association of Psychopharmacology guidance, which is a bit newer, offer us a number of treatments. Quetiapine, uh, which I guess um, there'll be uh, plenty of people taking. Lorazidone, which is newer and with less of an evidence base. Olanzapine. Um, the guidelines also mention lamotrigine for bipolar depression. Um, ECT uh, works very well. I spend a lot of my time doing ECT and I really like it. Um, and lithium, not so good for pulling people out of depression, um, but for mild depression, it can make a difference and it can stop people going into depression. So what we're wanting to do in Newcastle is, is that those, that list of drugs, quetiapine, lorazid, Alanzapine, Lamotrigine, ECT, Lithium isn't adequate. And the reason that it isn't adequate is because the drugs have side effects, um, which you'll know, and they don't, they work great for some people, and if they work, fantastic, but they don't work for everybody, and we just want more options. We want to be able to get people better who aren't getting better with, with what's currently on the table. Um, and that's why we're looking at a study called, that's why we started and we're running a study called PAX-BD, um, which some may have heard of. PAX-BD is um, a clinical trial that's running across um, um, a number of centres, um, 25, 30 centres across the UK. So it may well be that it's running in a centre near you. Um, and um, um, it's a comparison of Pramipexol uh, against placebo, so against dummy tablets for people with bipolar depression. Why Pramipexol? Pramipexol is a drug that um, is used in, in Parkinson's. Uh, so it's a drug that boosts dopamine, which is why it works in Parkinson's. And what you can do, uh, if you think about depression symptoms, and what I quite like to do is separate them into two. So you can separate depression symptoms into those symptoms that people have too much of. Fear, anxiety, irritability, loneliness, guilt, disgust, hostility, pessimism. And those symptoms on the other side that people don't have enough of, enough pleasure, enough joy, enough interest, motivation, energy, enthusiasm, alertness, self-confidence. And it's these symptoms, uh, the pleasure, joy, interest, that the dopamine drugs particularly seem to work well for. Dopamine boosts reward systems. And so if you're getting a better kickback for anything that you do, 
it helps you be motivated. It helps you to be interested. And obviously, the more you are motivated, the more you are interested, the more you're doing, and there's a knock-on effect. So dopamine is a drug for what we call anhedonia, that absence or, or lack of those positive, uh, joyful, uh, motivational symptoms. So dopamine works particularly well for that. Prampexil is a pro-dopamine drug. So we just want to know whether it really works. It looks like people with Parkinson's who were also depressed got better. Small trials in bipolar show that Prampexil looks to work, but we need to do a good, big, robust study to see if it, it works. Um, so that's PAX-PD. Uh, people with, who come into the trial have got bipolar disorder. They're currently depressed um, with a quids SR score. Now, quids is a, um, a depression rating scale score. And it's SR stands for self-rated. Um, and if anyone uh, wants to have a look and see what you know your or your you know loved ones quiz SR score is, you can have a look on our website on the NCMD website, Northern Central Mood Disorders website, and have a look. Um, we're looking at a score of ten for people coming into the study, of saying that they're sufficiently depressed to warrant. And we're saying that people coming in for Prometexol shouldn't be the other drugs, the existing drugs shouldn't be more appropriate. So either folk who've taken uh, quetiapine and it's not worked or taken it and not they've got side effects or who've said look actually i know about the side effects of these drugs i really don't want to take them i'm looking for something else that's the case where the trial comes in where promopixel as a clinical treatment we're using it more and more in the mood disorder service in newcastle um, for depression for, for those reasons but we really need to know whether it works so that's the promopixel study um we need 290 patients. Um, and so there's a point in that really, which is that it's very hard uh, to run clinical studies. And, you know, I can sit here uh, and say, look, I've got this study and it's great. People should come to it. But uh, actually, you know, helping people access studies, know about studies that might be relevant and access them. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why, why that's very difficult. Um, and so getting 290 people with bipolar disorder, you heard, Rosie at the beginning say how common bipolar disorder was um, and um, and we know that depression is the big problem with bipolar disorder that people spend most of their time more of their time depressed than anything else um, but yet it's still so very difficult um, and um, and so the more that um, uh, folks can get involved in clinical trial and knock on your doctor's doors say, look, are there any clinical trials that are suitable for me? What about PAX-PD, for instance? Then that's great. Um, 290 patients will be very difficult to do, um, but we're running it and we're going for it, and we're, that's why we're opening sites across the country to try and make that possible. So that's the PAX-PD study. It's ongoing. It's been running for about a quarter of its time. We'll come back another day and tell you whether or not the drug seems to work, whether the study was successful, whether we recruited enough people, and whether the drug seems to work. So that's that one. It's an ongoing study. Now, I also want to tell you about a study that um, we have. Um, I'm going to just see if I can share my screen, see if it doesn't magically come to life. Um, no. Um, so um, um, a study that we, we are... Um, um, we've had funding for and we're going to start um, next year. It's a study called ASCEND, um, which is a combination of aripiprazole and sertraline um, for bipolar depression. Now, the reason that we're looking at this drug, uh, looking at this combination of drugs, is, is if I take you back to that list um, in the beginning that I talked about of drugs that are recommended for bipolar depression, quetiapine, lorazidone, olanzapine, lamotrigine, ECT, lithium. The thing that's missing from that is antidepressants. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know how many people here are taking antidepressants because oh, I've got chat function. Um, I'll, uh, I'll come to that and look at that. Um, uh, because because we all use, as doctors, we all use antidepressants, but there isn't any evidence. Well, there's very little evidence that they work. So um, there's been one big trial of antidepressants against placebo in bipolar depression, and it, and it failed. It didn't show any better, any benefit of the antidepressant. Um, so um, uh, it looks like that's antidepressants taken by themselves. The evidence is that they don't work. Antidepressants taken in a long mood state, long-term mood stabilizer, so lithium or valproate 
or lamotrigine plus an antidepressant. The antidepressant doesn't appear to confer any additional benefit and it can cause problems. It can um, cause side effects. It can make people more likely to move into rapid cycling. Now, um, there's, there's, there's a couple of points about that I want to make. So one is there isn't evidence that antidepressants work either by themselves or alongside with a stabilizer. But other, the other one is so many people taking antidepressants because, you know, it feels like they should work. Doctors like to use them. Um, uh, uh, but it also just, again, comes back to this notion of there's not enough evidence. It's hard to run clinical trials. There aren't enough people have, have gone into the studies. So we've got a study of 120 people showing that, that antidepressants don't work. It, it's not enough to be confident that, that um, you know, I'm stating that as a fact. All I can say is the research studies don't show a benefit of antidepressants. The one place where antidepressants do look to work is, is fluoxetine specifically alongside um, olanzapine. Um, and that combination, um, so uh, it looks like olanzapine fluoxetine combination is better than placebo in treating depression. That's the only place where there's an evidence base for, for antidepressants. Now, um, I don't know how, how, how familiar you are with olanzapine, how many people have taken olanzapine. Um, but um, it's it's got problems. It can cause uh, metabolic side effects. It can cause um, cholesterol and triglycerides to go up. It can cause weight gain. It can lead on to diabetes. Uh, so there's a great caution about using olanzapine uh, long term in in depression. But that notion that we could take an antipsychotic drug and combine it with an antidepressant drug is a simple and nice and makes sense. So we might have a combination. The aripiprazole is supporting the antidepressant, augmenting it, making it work better in, in depression, and also being there in case people get manic, so it's a protection against mania. So that aripiprazole plus an antidepressant combination is what we're looking at. Um, and, um, um, and the reason why aripiprazole, well, aripiprazole is because, first of all, it's nicer. It doesn't cause the same side effects that lansapine does, particularly at low doses, people at higher doses. You know, taking five, 10 milligrams, certainly 15, 20 milligrams, runs into things like restless uh, legs, aphasia, um, and other side effects. But the low doses seem to work very well, uh, augmenting antidepressants. So that's what we're looking at. Low dose aripiprazole uh, plus sertraline, see if that's effective in the treatment of depression. And the study, um, we're just in the process now of, uh, we've got the funding, we're setting it up, we're getting it to run. We've got uh, 10 sites across the country. Um, and I'm going to test myself here to see whether I can remember where they all are. So we've got Newcastle, Oxford, Nottingham, London. Um, we've got a couple of sites in the southwest, Bristol and Cornwall. And we've got Brighton um, and Birmingham. And... Uh, yeah, and one more uh, that will that will come to me if you ask me. Um, so we we and we're going to run that next year, um, and that's exciting because all of a sudden that gives us a new treatment, a combination of aripiprazole plus sertraline for bipolar depression. And if that works, doesn't cause side effects. That's going to be a major change. It's going to make a big difference to lots of people's lives, I think. So that's it. That's my talk. Final slide is my conclusion, which is to say. Bipolar disorder is being actively investigated as a focus in uh, uh, in Newcastle, Oxford, Nottingham, London, and Glasgow. There's a real need for this work, particularly to improve treatment options. There's a lack of funding and difficulties in recruitment and getting the people to the studies, the studies to the people. They're major, significant, real, big problems. PAX-BD is our study that's ongoing, Pramipexol, see if that can boost reward systems, give more motivation, treat depression that way, and ascend, see if we can get a safe combination that's going to treat depression uh, without causing side effects in a way that, you know, some of the others don't. Aripiprazole in unipolar depression, in, in, in depression without bipolar, seems to work really, really well. So we're hoping that we can translate that into, into bipolar disorder. Um, and... Um, and that's it. So we're 15 minutes ahead of schedule, which is amazing, um, which gives us a little bit more time for questions. Um, uh, so um, and there's some lots of interesting stuff in the chat. 
But I guess I'm not going to pick up on that. I'll let everybody, um, I want to sort of hold it and be, but we'll let everybody else come in um, and, um, and, uh, and see where, where we go with the, with the things in the chat um, and any other questions. Yes, hi everyone. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. Um, so yes, we'll have some questions and answers now. Um, so the first question is, someone has said, is it common for services to have a philosophy of not giving a diagnosis or a label? Adi, do you want to answer that one? Um, I'll speak from a child and adolescent mental health perspective and then perhaps Stuart might chip in from a sort of adult mental health perspective. Be lovely to hear what Livy, because you've had the lived experience. Um, unfortunately, um, I think um, I appreciate the comment stroke question. In child and adolescent mental health uh, services, I think people worry that a diagnosis might um, uh, cause stigma. Um, I personally disagree with that approach. I think it was, um, I was at the launch of the interim meeting uh, report uh, from Bipolar UK at Parliament, and it was actually a breath of fresh air to hear <clears throat> so many people highlight the importance of early and accurate diagnosis. I think diagnoses are like a visa in your passport. They, they Yes, they, they, there is, and you heard Livy talk about the fact that although she suspected and people had wondered, it was um, it was difficult and emotional, but I think it allows you to perhaps move forward. Um, I think services, the NHS is very, very good. I mean, I don't think any of us would not want the NHS to be to, to not be around, but the NHS is very good at doing things to people rather than with people. And I think that's where, but it is changing and it's heading in that direction. You know, Stuart's talked about the, the research and, you know, now not only do we ideally want to link up more and more with Bipolar UK, but also with patient and public advisory groups that inform our research and help us co-design it. So to, it, apologies for the long-winded response, but yes, um, CAM services are slightly against diagnoses in some parts, not all, um, but that is changing. And I'm afraid I think the only way is for, um, you know, for service users, carers, um, and I suppose like-minded clinicians to work together to improve that. Um, I'll hand over to Stuart from a sort of adult perspective and then hear from Livy, her lived experience. Um, we're talking a lot about um, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder um, at the moment, talking to uh, GPs and psychiatrists about it. Um, and um, I, I think, uh, so, so, so if, I take bi if I forget about bipolar disorder, first of all, I think about some of the other diagnoses that we use in psychiatry. I think people in psychiatry are very reluctant to diagnose borderline personality disorder. I think people are, are because... There's a perception of a stigma with that. I think that people are reluctant to diagnose schizophrenia because there's a perception of a stigma with that. But I don't think that's quite the same with bipolar disorder. Um, I think um, that there's less uh, reluctance um, to to make that diagnosis. Uh, and I, but I think I think there's a difficulty difficulty. So that classic picture of someone having a manic episode and you know doing crazy things. Um, and then uh, having a depressive episode and being very depressed and then being well for a while that 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 uh, some doctors look for it doesn't accord with what what we really see and so we see you know we talk about this condition of bipolar 2 which is in which people are are, are symptomatic either too high or too low particularly too low for long periods of time um, uh, and I think that that's where the diagnostic uncertainty lies. I don't think it's a reluctance to make the diagnosis. I think that there's a difficulty in making the diagnosis because we're not in a position to have, you know, blood tests or brain scans uh, to, to say that. Um, and um, um, I also think that, um, so the diagnosis is difficult, um, but, but it's clear that diagnosis is getting missed. 
Um, one of the things that, that we know is that if we survey people with a questionnaire, say, you know, have, has your mood ever been elevated? People who are, in, who are receiving antidepressants for depression, we will unearth quite a number of people who, who actually have bipolar disorder. So, so the diagnosis is getting missed. Rosie touched on that and the reasons for that um, right in the beginning. Liv. Um, well, with my diagnosis, as obviously my experience is not the same experience as everyone else who's had bipolar disorder. Um, but I feel like in my initial assessment with children and young people services, they weren't scared to say, oh, you might have bipolar. They instantly listened to me and they were like, they have they were said they said oh i think you might have bipolar but we're gonna have to look into that and there was a long process to you know get to that destination of the diagnose of the diagnosis um i am also diagnosed with eupd i saw on the chat about how people might be diagnosed with eupd but i'm also diagnosed with eupd and bipolar too um but that's through many um a long a long long time of like tests and observations and assessments and stuff like that like I haven't just plucked the diagnoses out of thin air but I definitely think there is there are stigmas attached to mental illness but I think it's different with every mental illness I guess but I think with my personal diagnosis they weren't afraid to saying, oh, you're bipolar, because, you know, I've had specialists like Dr. Sharma, you know what I mean? If if I could just just add one more one more thing, I think I think Stuart's it Stuart's right that you know that the slight difference though in in child and adolescent mental health is that uh, certainly when I started working in the field about 15 years ago, um, you know, everybody, child psychiatrists would say, why bother? Kids don't have bipolar. Um, and I'm sure some of you have heard this. It's, it's not true. Uh, and it is changing. You know, there's increased awareness amongst um, child and adolescent mental health professionals about this condition. But if you hear that, the one thing that I would say is the NICE guidelines have been very helpful. And Please state that the NICE guidelines themselves say that the peak age of onset is 16 to 19 years. So it is possible to be diagnosed with bipolar uh, under the age of 18. So um, if you're hearing that, please use that evidence. Uh, that's that's uh, it from me, Anna. Maybe to the next question. Uh, yeah, thank you. So next question we have is, why is bipolar sometimes called a chemical imbalance in the brain. Who would like to start off with this one? Stuart? Probably yeah. better with you. Yeah, 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 I can go with that. Um, well, the, um, uh, so the, the depression, first of all, was caused a, called, caused a chemical imbalance in the brain. And it was called, it was called a chemical imbalance in the brain because um, uh, drugs, that um, increased levels of serotonin and noradrenaline seem to help depression. And because if we experimentally lowered levels of serotonin and noradrenaline, then that could make people feel depressed. Um, and, uh, and if we had drugs that, 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 uh, that depleted, so that took away uh, noradrenaline and serotonin, again, we got, um, that made people feel depressed. So, um, so there's a very sort of simplistic response to that to say, oh, well, therefore, if you boost your serotonin or your noradrenaline, then you will feel better. Um, you know, that's, you know, we're now 50 years on from that idea and recognize that, you know, the brain's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so um, um, I guess that's, that's, where, that's where the idea comes from. Um, but, uh, you know... Neither Addy nor I, you know, talk in those in those kind of terms. We recognise that there's, you know, an awful lot more going on than than uh, seesaw in different uh, different um, 
serotonin or noradrenaline type chemicals. Finished. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next question is, what is the single best thing we can do to help our bipolar disorder? Who would like to start with that one? Me. Okay, Stuart, go on. Um, <laughs> know yourself. Um, so um, uh, whether it's through, uh, you know, talking about yourself to people that love you, whether it's about recording your mood over time, uh, learn about yourself, learn about what the first signs are that things are going wrong. If you're starting to go high, how do you feel? What, what, what can you notice? What can other people notice? If you start to go down, what's the first things? Because you want to be able to, to, to uh, nip those, those things in the bud. Um, and act on them and 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 once once mania comes and it becomes too late it becomes a big struggle to get better or deep depression is a big struggle to get better but but early doors it's easy i was talking to a guy this morning and um a, a patient this morning and he said he said he was he was in his he's 63 now so he's you know he's well, i've known him for a long time he said he was in his in his canoe uh and uh, the rapids were there and below him and he could feel them pulling at him and he just went you know i'm not going to go there i'm not going to go into that manic episode and he paddled furiously he was paddling as i spoke to him he was paddling furiously backwards into the backwaters where he would be safe and 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 he will be you know he, he knows he knows himself he knows the things that, that that help he restricts the amount of contacts that he has with other people that works for him for other people it's different things he makes sure he said to me, it's all about routines. Um, uh, he, so when he's starting to feel that he's not well, he just makes sure he gets up at the same time every day. He has his meals at the same time. He said to me, it's boring, but it works. Um, so routines and knowing yourself. Thanks, Stuart. Just to add, Anna, if I may, yeah. uh, I think Stuart's absolutely right. We, I think we'd be naive, Stuart and I, to suggest that you know, one size fits all. So it's a lovely question to ask and it comes from a place of caring and compassion, clearly. Uh, but I think I completely echo um, Stuart's point that you know, know, know your disorder or know the disorder of the person that you're supporting um, and perhaps um, uh, you know, identify uh, both what are the things to look out for and how you would get help. Um, particularly important if you're at university, if you're away from parents or, 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 or living away from, you know, loved ones, exactly, you know, what are the numbers for the crisis team or how you get help uh, so that we can avoid something becoming too severe. Um, yeah. Can we have a live answer on that one as well? What makes a difference for you, Liv? I go. Um, well, when I have a manic episode, this sounds dead weird, but I can feel it in my stomach when it mm -hmm. like. So when I start to have to have those feelings in my stomach, I instantly go tell my family. I'm like, I'm gonna have a manic episode, and so then they can support me through it. Even though I do struggle with my manic episodes, especially with like finances and stuff like that, my parents and my friends and my family and whatnot are very understanding and they don't shame me. And I think having that support there is so important. And if you don't have that support, then, well, if I didn't have that support, I would just spiral out of control. What yeah, um, I think Stuart just touching on knowing yourself is like if your sleep is slipping. I think that's yeah. one of the key things I notice is when the, when sleep slips, it's 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 kind of a bit of a sign as well. So. Um, thank you. So the next question is, um, someone wants to know what are your thoughts on psychedelic medicines? There's obviously been some stuff in the media about it being potential treatment for depression, but what do you think about bipolar? Um, I think it's, um, I think it's early days. Um, so there's been, um, there's a study with um, 
psilocybin, which we've been part of in Newcastle, which is a positive and shows that um, the, you know, this is the drug that's in magic mushrooms um, that used in the right way. Um, so I'm not advocating, um, you know, early morning foraging, but used in the right way, um, it, it, it can be helpful. And the notion of it, the separation of the brain and mind, to, I'm not exactly sure what, how it works, but it, but it looks positive. We don't know for sure that it works. Early studies are positive. There's going to be more studies in depression, and we can really test it out. Bipolar disorder, bipolar depression, that's another step. Um, we've got increased risks, obviously, always with bipolar disorder, that we don't want anything that's going to make people uh, go manic or go psychotic. Um, so um, I, I think it's not, you know, I, I don't have bipolar disorder. If I did, I wouldn't take magic mushrooms. I would be waiting and following the science and see what happens. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on this one? Or should we move on? Uh, uh, yeah, Anna, not, mu not much to add from me, but <laughs> okay. uh, I, I think I, what I'd just say is that as a child psychiatrist, I think it's we have to be even more careful, especially with young people. But um, I think, you know, researchers, particularly the pharma companies, are being encouraged now that whenever they're trialing any new medication in adults, that to also have a pediatric plan. So this is a, a European wide initiative. So let's hope that there will be, you know, if there are more evidence based treatments for adults, including perhaps psychedelics, then uh, we might have some um, children and young people also included in, the, in that. Um, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, if you could choose one thing that the government or NHS could do differently, uh, what would it be? Does it have to be just one thing? It, maybe it could be more than one thing if you want to go for your top three. Well, if it's if it's one thing, um, I'd ask the government to not meddle with the NHS. Anyone else want to come in? Uh, yeah, well, I think of another answer. The obvious thing that the government needs to do is reverse Brexit and uh, get us back into Europe and uh, stop all this um, um, uh, stigmatisation of, of, of people who are coming into this country um, because they need to. Um, but that's not what we're on at the moment, is it? We're on bipolar disorder. Um, did, did the government's talked for a long time about um, parity of esteem between physical and mental health. Um, and we've not seen those promises lived up to. We've we've heard a lot about new funding, um, and it doesn't always come through to services. Um, there is a push at the moment with the government to um, develop um, a better infrastructure so that we can deliver clinical research because it's very difficult to do it at the moment. Um, and um, and hopefully, you know, those changes will come into play. Um, and we will see a difference and we'll see more clinical research being possible. Um, I definitely would say transition services uh, for the NHS because yeah, very good point. my transition from child services to adult services, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to swear, but it was crap. It was so bad. Um, like obviously this each independent service are, are equally good in their own ways. Uh, obviously they're gonna have their ups and downs, but definitely transition services because I was 18 and then being, you know, tossed into adult services where, you know, people don't really believe you is a bit, it's a bit invalidating of my illness my disorder and it really like upset me when people in certain CPNs are just invalidating your disorder being like oh yeah bipolar mm -hmm. and I'm like mate I'm, I've been diagnosed calm down yeah yeah I mean I, 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 Addy and I are just internally nodding at that it's not just a transition from from child to adults it's a ch transition from adult to old age we have it's a it's the discontinuities between primary care and secondary care. It's the discontinuities between 
uh, inpatient care and community care. Um, it, uh, you know, it's a fragmented it's a fr fragmented health service, and we need to do what we can it, for all kinds of reasons. You know, but we have to do what we can to make it work as a whole. Yeah, I'd just like to not only act access in the early diagnostic diagnostic times, but also the aftercare. So it's making sure people learn to live well with it as soon as possible, and and actually then can can have that good life and and get on with life. Um, so yeah, so funding all the way really, with the parity of services. Thank you. So we've got another question here. Um, what are the best ways to support someone with bipolar? Um, Liv, do you want to come in? Um, how would you sort support someone with bipolar? Is that the question? Yeah. What's the best ways to support someone with bipolar? Basically, no judgment, because some of the things that I've done, whilst manic or delusional, or you know, when I have delusions of grandeur, I once dressed up as a bloody uh, <laughs> jungle princess. I fully convinced myself I was a jungle princess, and like that behaviour is weird to outsiders. But when people know that you've got bipolar disorder and you are quite ill, um, it it's just great not having the judgment there and like, you can just be who you want to be uh, whilst you're just you know vibing along with the illness um it's good to just not be shamed and you know as I said previously having that support like I cannot like you know it's just support and not having any judgment and just being kind and accepting that's what I want from you know people around me to be you know accepting of me and my illness and just see that if I'm acting like an absolute um idiot <laughs> if I'm acting like an idiot then I want them to know that it's it's a disorder and it's not me being a prick Yeah, I, I, I mean, Liv, it, uh, as Stuart said before, it's very hard. You're, you're a very hard <laughs> act to follow. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Liv. Uh, you know, I think Olivia described it so well. It is about being non-judgmental and, and essentially supportive in, in the truest sense of the word, you know, with all the compassion and caring. Um, I don't think and and but but I also do appreciate that caring for somebody with any chronic health condition uh, can be difficult. So the only thing that I would add is that as a carer or as or somebody who's you know supporting, please don't forget to look after yourself uh, because because the person you're looking after needs you to be well. Um, and the analogy I use is is the analogy. You know, I do this with families, especially with mums, dads, and also siblings, uh, the brothers and sisters of those that are affected, especially you know the children that I see, young people. It's it's really important, and I often tell them that um, you know when you get onto an aeroplane, they always do the the safety drill and will tell you that in case of an emergency, oxygen masks will descend. Please, you put yours on before you help a young person or someone else. So, just make sure that you've got the oxygen there for you, because otherwise you can't actually care for the people you love and want to care for. So that's the only thing I would add. Does anyone else want to come in on this one? No. Yeah, just adding on to that from Addy's point and this point is, is use peer support for yourself. So it's a good way to self-care as well, is, is accessing peer support for yourself. Um, and that can help both of you, really. Yeah, there was a question in the chat. Someone wanted, um, seeking peer support. Um, and, and my experience of, of um, bipolar peer support groups has been really, really positive, that they just do seem to be really helpful. Um, and we do have them in the Northeast. I think the comment was about groups in the Northeast. Um, and, um, you know, I can connect with the Newcastle ones if you want. But... Um, we've got them
Um, yeah, I'll put the um, the support group link in the chat just now. If anyone has any more questions, uh, please just pop them in the chat. And I, if I go on. sorry, if I may, just I, I noticed something on the chat. There was um, somebody who was finding it quite hard to feel heard, perhaps, um, uh, and um, uh, their relationship. Well, I think in their case, perhaps with their community mental health team was was not very very good. Um, I just wanted to say that um, obviously, please do use the peer support uh, mechanism because you might hear about other. You might hear from other people how they were able to get support in, in the same area. Uh, but the other thing to add is that almost all NHS organizations now have a, have a process by which you can seek uh, a change of team or a change of consultant psychiatrist. If, if you know, there are, there are sort of explicit reasons why, but it is possible to request a change. Um, Perhaps just have a, a request a meeting with uh, the team manager for the team and try and put your point across and and see if that might help. Um, apologies, I don't mean to. I really don't mean to sound patronising, but I'm trying to uh, perhaps think of solutions to your your issue. But you do have a right to request a change um, of consultant and or team um, if required. And indeed, you can always request a second opinion from you know a specialist service such as the one that Stuart works in for adults or I work for kids sorry that's all I wanted to say Anna just wanted to add that no thank you thank you for that um yeah so I think uh I haven't got any more questions uh, Anna can I pick up a quick one Steph said yeah, from... Steph said the primary pixel study is that just for people with bipolar too no it's for anyone with bipolar disorder who's currently depressed okay yeah, thank and you. And the other thing from the chat is ECT doesn't cause brain damage. Oh, so, okay. Um, okay, does anyone have any like closing remarks? We've got another webinar on Thursday, which is for Wales, but it's it's open to anyone who'd like to join. Um, and then we've got another one next Thursday evening as well. Um, but yeah, does anyone else like to add anything before we go? Thanks for everybody for giving their time up. Thank you. And thanks for joining the session. I think I speak on behalf of Stuart, Liv and myself, uh, although I'm sure they might want to add. Thank you for having us. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is our little bit of chipping away at the system so that people get a timely uh, and early diagnosis so that interventions can start. So um, long may this movement continue. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye -bye. And thank you for all your comments in the chat as well. And hope we answered as many of your questions as we could. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well done, Bipolar UK. Thank you all.